Good morning, church. How are you this morning? Good? Good. It's so good to be here. Um, yeah, as Nathan was, was saying, I moved to the U.S. in 2017 to start Denver Seminary. I graduated in 2020. I think I'm going to move here so I can see everyone. Uh, so, I can, uh, so I could finish my degree at Denver Seminary. I graduated in 2020, got my pandemic wedding. Uh, <laughs> 28 people with the groom and the bride included, so very small, uh, very meaningful. And right now I'm a pastor at Westside Church Internacional. But, but yeah, uh, Sacred Grace was the very first place I visited in the U.S. Uh, there's no reason why I didn't come back <laughs> as I was asked in the, first, um, in the first service. The only reason was that I just arrived to the country and I didn't have a car to come here. But beautiful church, uh, wonderful people, um, and some of you actually are my friends on Facebook, so I'm able to recognize you right now. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, when I moved to the U.S., um, as you may imagine, I had a big cultural shock. I come from a culture that most of the things are done collectively. Most of the things, um, we're, we, we are taught since very little that when we think or we do something, this has an effect on other people. And it was a great shock to me that when I moved to the U.S., I encountered a way to live that was very different. In some ways, way better. And in some ways, I could see definitely um, a view or a way of behaving that kind of goes in contrast with how the church um, should relate to each other. And this was the biggest shock for me was the individualistic mindset in the United States. Uh, as I was mentioning before, since very little in Bolivia, you are taught to like, you know, think about others. Whatever you do, you do it also for others, having yourself in mind, but also knowing that this has repercussions in other people. And maybe we tend to, to take that to an extreme in my culture, but maybe I am seeing that we are thinking to take this to the other extreme in this current culture that I am encountering right now. And um, I think Paul addressed this issue with Timothy as well and he kind of gave him the broader vision on how to how to guide himself in life and how to run his his individual race for the collective matter and for the keeping always the collective point of view and i when i see the relationship with paul and timothy i'm really inspired because i see a guy called timothy who is very shy who's very young and feels unprepared but he definitely is inspired to pursue more to pursue more than what he could give or think about even in his lifetime, and to pursue more than just his own ambitions. And today I want to talk about that uh, with us. I believe and I prayed to God uh, to tell me what, what should we learn today, what should we uh, be reminded of this, this Sunday morning. And this is a lesson that came to my mind. And this lesson is in 2 Timothy 2.2. And just to give you a little bit of background, when Paul writes this specific letter, that is 2 Timothy, the way he expresses changes in a ways a little bit, in other ways very drastically compared to other letters. And the main um, reason why this happens is because when Paul writes 2 Timothy, he knows that his departure from earth is coming up soon. He writes from Roman imprisonment, and he knows that his time is coming up. So he mentions a couple of things like, I am in the lion's mouth. I am chained like an animal. My time of departure is coming near. So he knew. He knew he was not going to be here for much longer. Now, you may think how you would react or how you have seen others in the past react when they're in their uh, the last moments here on earth, what are the main things people do? You know, it's usually very important things that they want to do, like forgiving others or, or being forgiven by others, you know. And some, uh, some people will think, hey, I better let people know where the money is hidden, you know, <laughs> or other things like that. But you, you do think about it. If you know that you're going to depart from earth pretty soon, you would think about, okay, I, I have so much time. What should I tell others, you know, others close to me? And in this case, what is the message that Paul thought it was so important that he left to Timothy when he knew his time to departure was near? And the message was this. We find it in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. He says, 
and which you, what you have heard from me through many witnesses and trusted to faithful people who will be able to teach it to others as well. Paul here is talking about a plan that goes farther than his own lifetime, that goes farther than Timothy's own lifetime, that goes farther than your lifetime, and that goes farther than my lifetime. He's talking about a race, about a race that involves many generations. He says, you know, what you have heard from me also entrusted to other people, so these people can also entrust it to other people. He's talking about different generations passing into information, passing into teaching. And basically he's saying, I didn't start this and I'm not going to be here when this finishes. So I got to make sure that since my time of departure is soon, it's coming up soon, I need to tell you this. So you would also tell others that will tell other people. We can only imagine the consequences that would have if Moses hadn't teach um, Joshua, what he learned from the Lord, what he knew from the Lord, what, what he experienced in the times that he spent with the Lord. He taught Joshua so he could teach it to others, so they could teach it to others and others and others until it is us who are sitting here today and we're able to hear about this. And that's exactly what Paul is referring to. He's talking about a generational relay race. Now, I don't know how many of you know how a relay race goes, but in a relay race, you have different people competing for the same team. And you have people holding something like this, which is called a baton. So the first person starts with the baton, and they need to run as fast as they can as any race and pass it to the next person who will receive it and then pass it to the next person who will receive it. And you need at least three people to call it a relay race, but it could be, it could be more than that. Usually they go for four people. And it is not until the very last person has passed the baton through the finishing line until the team is considered to be done. And I think this serves us as a great illustration of what Paul is trying to say here. When he says, pass this so they would pass it to others, so they would pass it to others, he's recognizing that he's not it. He might be the one that's running his part of the race, but there's others that are coming after him. Unless he's able to pass this baton, and we'll call it the baton of faith, unless he's able to pass it smoothly, then the whole race doesn't make any sense. In a, next, in a um, relay race, we have two areas that are very important. One is the exchange zone. So the exchange zone is, is in a specific area of the race course. And this specific area that is 10 meters or 20, 20 meters, 20 meters uh, exchange zone, it's the only zone in the entire race where you can actually exchange the baton. You cannot be done with your part before and just say, hey, I'm kind of tired, so you need to come closer to me so I can pass it to you. Or you can say, hey, I'm feeling great, so how about I run, uh, I run part of your race and then I pass this to you. You have a specific, uh, specific zone where you can exchange this. You cannot pass it in any other place. But before the exchange zone, you have another zone that is called the acceleration zone. And the acceleration zone is a 10-meter zone where you're about to be done with your portion. You're about to reach the exchange zone. But you actually, instead of going slower or slowing down because your part is coming to an end, you actually need and are required to accelerate in order to pass the baton smoothly. To run a good relay race, a smooth exchange in the exchange zone is crucial if you want your team to succeed and to win the race. Sometimes we confuse Christianity and we believe it's something that only affects me and that I can control how I run my race. That it's an individual sprint and it's not. It's a relay race, and we confuse it to individual sprint, and we think, hey, whether I do my part or not, it doesn't really matter, and it does. Can you imagine if Paul would say, you know what, I don't really, I think I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good halfway. I kind of already did my first missionary trip. I think I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm doing more than average, but he kept going. He kept going until he knew his departure was near, and he was like, you know what, I think I need to let others know about this, that this is not it. This is not ending now. I need to continue to pass this. Can you imagine if runner one runs and passes the baton and then runner two gets it and runs and then tries to pass the baton and the last person is nowhere near to be found? 
And when you look around there as spectator and just watching, they're like, yeah, you know, I didn't feel like running today. I was, I was pretty tired. You can't do that in a race, right? You need, everyone needs to be involved because the consequences of one of the people involved in the race not running a good race has consequences in all other people. And this is what Paul is trying to teach to Timothy. He says, what you have heard from me, which implicitly means that Paul heard it from someone else, right? What you have heard from me through many witnesses entrusted to faithful people, people that will be willing to run this race, who will be, te- who will be able to teach it to others as well. Entrust it. Other version says, pass it along. Other versions say the same commitment that I have, the same, this same commitment, look for this man. People that are committed, people that are trustworthy. What Paul is basically saying is, my time is coming to an end. I am in the exchange zone right now. I've accelerated my acceleration zone as much as I could. We all know that verse. I have fought the good battle. I have run the race. I have kept the faith. He did not slow down towards the end. He accelerated. And what he's saying is, you know what, Timothy? I am in the exchange zone right now. I need to pass the baton to you. Would you take care of the teachings that I'm holding generations of generations of passing this, would you take care of it and would you pass it to the next one and make sure that they pass it to the next one as well. Sacred Grace, make sure that you carry the baton of faith to your next generation and that you run this race collectively and not individually. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I love that this this passage starts with therefore because it actually gives you a little more homework. If if it says therefore, it essentially means that there's something that you should look before. Then then because of that, therefore, this passage is is being told. And therefore means Hebrews 11, which is the chapter before where we can see we're not going to go over it. So if you want to see it at home, you will be, trust me, you will be very inspired. You will realize that if you have felt like, hey, I'm feeling pretty lonely in this hey I'm feeling like this um, discipleship is not working I'm feeling like bringing the gospel to my personal business is not really working I feel like serving is not really going anywhere read Hebrews 11 it will show you that there were so many before you that carried this before you and that they did it with excellence and that they were able to hold this baton of faith and pass it to the next generation that whole chapter says by faith Abraham did this by faith Noah did this other thing by faith and just you can see how they held to this and they understood you know what this is my part of the race this is my section and I am I am accountable for this section and just as this was passed to me can I hold this can I hold on to this and run as fast as I can even if I cannot see and I will never see the ending line And I will never make it to the ending line, but I am responsible for this part of the race. The author tells us, now it's your turn. Therefore, they believed, now it's your turn. Let us throw off everything. Who? Us. Who? You. And it is now the time. Sometimes we put so many excuses on why we don't want to serve right now. And we say, 
just hold on, God. You know, my children are little, so when they grow older, then I will be able to, to serve you. Then I will be able to happily carry this, you know. Hold on, God. You know, when I, when I uh, retire from my work, then I will have no commitments with anything. Then I will be able to pass this. Hold on, God. You know, I'm just a teenager. You know, I, you're asking too much of me. You know, I, I, when I'm an adult, then I will be able. And God is saying it is you and it is right now. Only you can pass the teachings that were passed on to you. No one can run this for you. You are surrounded by a cloud, a great cloud of witnesses. But this is your part of the race. And you are accountable for the baton of faith that was passed to you. And don't think for a second that you're by yourself or that you're running to, I don't know, to win God's favor or anything. No. He actually started this race for us. He, he started this race by dying in that cross and starting, starting this. He started with 12 people that he knew that would teach to other people, that we, he knew that would teach to other people until you and I are sitting here on the November, what is it, 20 of 2021. It has been effective. It has been passed and it has reached to us that we are now holding into this. I was explaining earlier today that there's a video on the internet, and you can, you can look it up later, about uh, a really race that a Chinese team was participating in. And in this video, it's kind of, you know, some people have put it as a comedy, and there's probably some of fun of it, but it's actually kind of sad because they, as they're running, everyone's kind of, every team is passing this smoothly, you know? And then you see the Chinese team when they replay it, and it seems like the first runner pass the exchange zone to pass the baton and then the second grabbed it and passed in the middle of that maybe she realized you know even if I make it to the end this is not going to count because this wasn't passing the exchange zone so she actually has to come back and then she passes to the first person who passes it again to her and she's like oh no but we actually need to go back to the exchange zone to exchange this because that is the exchange zone that where we exchange the baton you know so they actually both have to come back and then she grabs it finally and then she runs and kind of looks back and she's like am I good and her, you know, her friend is like, yes, go, go, you can run now, you know, and you can only imagine they made it last in the whole race. And I, I do honor that the fact that they kept running and they kept going really fast, which is something we, we should all do. But the, their participation or their lack of participation or their mistaken participation in the race had serious consequences in the entire result of their team. And just like they went through that, we need to understand that our participation, how we participate in this race, no matter how young, how old, how preparated, uh, we, we feel how timid, how any, any excuse that you can believe in the book, it does have a repercussion on the other people. We do have a part in our race. How smooth is that exchange going to be? when it's our turn, how smooth it's going to be when we learn that our time on earth, which we never know, we never know when our time of departure is near, how smooth is the exchange of the teachings that have been passed to us all the way from many, many generations ago, how smooth is that exchange going to be? Because what makes me really sad is to realize, hey, Moses was able to pass and to, to you know, live along with Joshua, bring along Joshua into what God was doing in the midst of Israel. And he's able to inspire this man and say, hey, you need to live in such a way, you need to guide people in such a way. And he's like, okay, got it, right? Got it, Moses. And then the saddest part is the Bible tells us that when Joshua passed away, the next generation did not know the Lord. It takes one generation. It does make a difference when one person that receives the baton, drops it instead of passing it to the next generation. What can we practically do about this? Paul kind of, le kind of leaves us an idea on how to do this in verse 5. You know, he basically when you're an athlete, you can't just eat whatever you want and work out whenever you want, right? No one that has eat whatever they want or done whatever they want goes to the Olympics. We all know that, right? 
And it's the same. It's the same about this. He, uh, Paul keeps comparing us to an athlete, and he says in verse 5, in the case of an athlete, no one is crowned without competing according to the rules. He's basically saying, you know, you cannot do just whatever you want. We cannot do just whatever we want. And sometimes I see this tendency in, in, in the current generation, which we're all, all part of, so I'm not splitting generations. I'm saying all the people that are part of the church today. And I see this tendency of wanting our ethnicity, our, uh, our specific cultural background, uh, our political view to intervene and try to change the Bible to fit us when the Bible was actually created to change us and to bring about unity in the midst of all our diversity. And sometimes we want to run this race and we're like, yes, I am Christian, I am committed, I'm going to run this race, but I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to decide what I wear and I want, I'm going to decide when I actually train and I'm going to decide how I'm going to run it. And God says, hey, I already kind of said the rules. Thanks for participating but <laughs> no more no more rules need to be put in place they're already placed there when jesus installed the great commission he said go and baptize people make it make disciples baptize people in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and sometimes we leave it at that we think yeah that's what christianity is about but then we forget that that verse continues and it says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. There is power. There is power, sacred grace. When you grab when you grab messages on Sunday, when you spend time with your kids teaching them about what Jesus did, when you're reading Bible stories in bedtime, when you're praying uh, around the table, there is power in that that has generational implications. Sacred grace, make sure that you carry the baton of faith to your next generation. That you run with excellence and that you run this race collectively and not individually. Paul ends this teaching in verse 7. After he said, hey, would you teach this so they would teach it to others? And hey, make sure that when you're running, you're running by the rules. And hey, one last thing, Timothy, reflect on what I am saying. For the Lord will give you insight into all this. In verse 5, Paul asks us to really and truly reflect, am I pondering? Am I really running my race? Am I putting every excuse in the book not to do it? Or am I running the race, but I'm wanting to put my own rules in this race that I didn't even start? It is up to you and the Lord, sacred grace. I would like us to start asking and reflecting upon today, am I pondering? Am I running a relay race or am I running an individual sprint? Some of us have been tricked to believe that whatever is trendy is what dictates my, my race. So right now in it, the world, it's trendy to think this way about God and to think this about marriage and to think this about identity and think about this about family and yada, yada. And then that has to inform my race. And it goes the other way. The competition has already begun. You're just part of passing it to the next person. But the rules have already been set in place. And some of us have forgotten that this is a relay race altogether. And we're running and we're getting exhausted and we're forgetting we're not alone. There's a cloud of witnesses. There's a generation before us. But if we don't understand that there was a generation before us to pass this, we won't understand that there's a generation after us that we need to pass this to as well. So when? Now. Who? Us. No one else. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Sacred grace. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. You're in the exchange zone right now. So on your marks, get set, and go. Would you join me in prayer to this morning? Dear God, thank you so much for making us part of this race. 
Thank you so much because you don't need us, but you entrust us with your teachings, God, that you have started many, many generations before us, the ones that are here sitting in this, in this room, God. Thank you because you entrust us a, a tiny piece of this generational relay race, and it is a privilege, God. It is not a burden. It is a privilege that you call this, and you entrust us of the baton of faith. So just as all the people in Hebrews 11 and all the people that we see in, um, in the book of Acts, God, and the, all the people that we see today, God, we are able to run this race knowing that we're not alone and knowing that we're accountable for this baton of faith that is in this current generation, God. God, put fear in our hearts and put love in our souls so we understand that the next generation relies on how good we run this race today. Give us grace, give us endurance, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, please equip us to run this race according to your rules, God. Make us good athletes of the gospel. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.